I am Kathy Sparrow, co-author of Ignite Your Leadership, Proven Tools for Leaders to Energize Teams, Fuel Momentum, and Accelerate Results. And I'm here today with Greg Voison, the uh, founder of Illuminate and host of the podcast Inside Personal Growth. And additionally, Greg's writing a very interesting, cool book called Hacking the Gap, A Journey from Intuition to Innovation and Beyond. I double check my titles here. So welcome, Greg. Welcome, Kathy. How are you? It's nice being on your show and Thank getting you. to speak with you about leadership. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about what you do. Well, uh, I work with medium and small businesses in Orange County and San Diego, California, helping them not only grow their businesses to a point where they can um, sell them at a higher price, but also working to improve efficiencies of their operations. Um, I assist them from everything from marketing and sales to analysis of you know, projections and forecasts and budgets and so on. So we have teams of people that come in and prepare the businesses and prepare the owners for the transition. A lot of times it's from one generation to the next because they're family owned businesses. Mm -hmm. um, these are usually businesses that are some anywhere from $4 million to $10 million in size. They're not really, really big businesses, but I love it because I get to deal with the owners. I get to get in the nitty gritty and I get to counsel people and actually coach them and help them personally and professionally grow. Nice. Nice. So over the time then you've uh, seen a lot of leadership skills done well and maybe not done so well. Uh, obviously, yes, because, you know, even in leadership with a family-owned business, you've got leadership roles. And, and even a family-owned business, it's even a little more different dynamic because it's a, a father, son, father, daughter. Um, oftentimes, there's managers and supervisors involved. So you get to see all the elements of leadership, but with an, even a different twist, that whole element of managing a relationship as a family member. Ooh, so what are some of the things that you see people stumble over when, when, when it comes to dealing with family and, and a business? Well, I think, you know, managing your emotions um, is, is really one of the biggest challenges. But, you know, if you've got a father who's been a leader of a company for 40 years and his son has been there 17 years, I just use this as an example, um, there is a lot of animosity that can occur, not even including the whole leadership issue because the father is the leader, the son wants to comply, yet the son is saying, hey, I've been here a long time and I feel like I should be doing more leading mm -hmm. instead of just listening to dad. So, you know, you can, you can take this into a big company as well. If leaders, whether it's a father or it's a president of a big corporation or a mid-sized corporation, they can't get their egos out of the way. Um, the reality is, is you, you have a challenge where animosity builds up, uh, tensions build up. Um, I think you have to be a truly authentic leader. You have to lead from the heart. You have to open up and let people know who you are. You can't hide behind this veil. Mm -hmm. that I'm the dad, I'm the leader, you have to open up and say, you know, I'm vulnerable too. And I think the, the biggest challenge with leaders is expressing their vulnerability as a leader and letting other, other people understand that, you know, hey, um, I'm a person as well as the leader. Person first, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the best advice you can give someone who – is in a family-owned situation on how to navigate that, um, perhaps that navigate that tension in the relationship besides being vulnerable. What else, what are some daily, you know, leadership practices that come into play? Well, I think letting go is one of them. In other words, uh, when you're a leader, you have to trust. And the biggest challenge with family-owned businesses is I've been doing this myself this way for a long time. Um, I don't trust those people to perform. But if you're going to grow any business successfully, 
um, one of the best ways to grow as a leader is to actually trust in your people, um, trust that they can perform the job as well as you can, and understand that if you are this business forward, that you have to let go. Um, you, you basically have to think of the business as a business with a thousand employees and that you're at the top of that business and that those people are engaged, uh, fully engaged. Um, they're not partially engaged. I mean, we can talk about the whole issue of engagement in corporations today, how low it is. You know, it's 17 to 20% of people that are actually engaged. That means 80% of the people are unengaged. And that has a, that has a factor on leaders being inclusionary, right? Uh, so it, it doesn't mean it has to come, it should always come from the top down, but it's also about these, the people that are in middle management. How good are they at engaging their teams, mm. uh, providing them the opportunity to express themselves and be open? Um, and, and that is a big factor. Yeah, and so to engage teams, you have, you almost have to instill that trust. Or if they don't, if an employee doesn't feel trusted, they're not going to be engaged. They're always going to be saying, "Why bother?" Right? Yeah, I mean, look, if you hire somebody and you went through the the painstaking efforts to do a search, and you did a profile on them, and you spent all that time to profile and figure out, you know, what's their personality like, and will they work well with the team, and all the things that company through try and fix this. If that's the case and you're confident with what, you know, either your HR department or you or whoever else was involved in, in hiring this person, then let them, give them the ropes, let them go, you know, let them do what you hired them to do, right? And then if mistakes are made, there's a challenge, which there will be, you know, look at it and say, look, it's okay to do this once, but it's not okay to do this a second time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, that's where accountability comes in. I think one of the things that leaders like to look at is they're saying, well, you know, were you accountable? Um, what are the factors of accountability that you have set up with inside the organization? Who are, the, who are they reporting to? And if they're reporting to that person, is that por- person doing a good job at reporting back to you what the potential issues might be? You know, I had a, I, I wrote this in my book. And a, a long time ago, a company came out and did it does a local magazine here and wanted to do a story. Um, and I said, the title of it should be, it's not business, it's personal. Mm-hmm. And the reason I said that is because all of business is personal. Yeah. 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 Can't take the, we're not little compartments, right? We can't. Right. Take- as long as you have people in your business, if it was just machines, just going and crunching along, that's fine. Machines don't care. But no, you've got all these sensitive personalities that have to be managed in a delicate way, uh, especially if you want productivity to increase because they have to see that there's a reason why they're part of this team to create a, a better product or a better service or to manage customers better. And that all has to be because they have to care. We were just talking about this. First, they have to care about themselves. They have to have their own personal purpose. And then they have to want to care enough to, to move forward with whatever the larger environment is that they're affecting, the thousands of people that they may have an effect on, to say that product or service has to be delivered with the highest level of integrity and quality that we can do it. Mm-hmm. Nice. So I know that you, you stepped into a leadership role when you were – in college, right? Right. Your dad's business, his uh, landscaping business. So, and you, you, you didn't take care of yourself in the process. You were burning the candle at all ends. And so when we were talking earlier, you you mentioned um, the importance of self-care of first, how does a leader who's busy, you know, got a to-do list a mile or two long, put themselves first in order to lead better. What's interesting, you know, I'm sitting here in my little office, you're interviewing me here on Zoom, and um, I'm looking over at my board, which you can't see, 
and I have it in three categories, and it's meaningful, mon- uh, meaningful, mandatory, and mundane. Mm-hmm. And so what I do is I divide my, my to-do tasks into what's meaningful today, what's mandatory, what is it that I have to do today, and what if it's mundane? You know, you could say, well, in, in the old Franklin Covey, that used to be the ABC method. What's the A, what's the B, and what's the C? It was interesting when I put the words meaningful, mandatory, and mundane on it, how it changed my mindset. And I think that's part of the issue for leaders who have a lot to do, is they really need to kind of compartmentalize what's the most important activity for the day. And focus in on those things first. Now, you know, you hear this from everybody from David Allen to any time management guru. They're all going to tell you this. But the reason our minds want to go back down to the mandatory and the mundane is because we think we can get more of those done. And the reality is, is you'll find out that you can get just as many things done on the meaningful and they have much more of a significant impact on your emotional well-being than the mandatory and the mundane. Mm -hmm. So the way I look at it is if you would just take more time to focus on that and say, okay, I'm going to spend two hours today working on my meaningful goals. Can you give me an example of one of your meaningful goals? Well, you know, I've had these meaningful goals on here. Write the conclusion to the book because I haven't done that yet. Uh, The second one is uh, give, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, Give Mike, the illustrator, the actual subset for the rest of the chapters that I'm working on. So everything you'll see that's on my meaningful has to do with the book. Mm -hmm. Because to me, that's my number one focus right now is, you know, while everything else distracts me, I still have this pull. I still have this urge because it's up there on the board and I know that it has to get done. Once it gets off of that board, I will put another meaningful goal on there, which will be the press kit and the the rest of the things that I have to do. Right. What I'm trying to do is do it in, I, I think when you, you interview people who are goal and task performance specialists, you know, they'll tell you, that the only way you can achieve any of this is the goal and then the subsets. In other words, the subcategory of that particular goal. Almost every one of the goals that's in meaningful has a subset, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, well, there's A or one, and then there's the subset to one, and how many steps are in it? And the reason that people will avoid that is because they know everything that's in meaningful has two or three different subsets to actually reach that particular goal to get it accomplished. Right. And, but when you go to the mandatory stuff, you can look at it and you could say, write an email to, to Mike. Well, that's easy. That's one step, right? Right, right. right. So when did you know that you were a leader? You know, I think, look, it goes back to the days that I was in Cub Scouts. Um, they would actually ask the kids, you know, who was going to be the leader of the pack, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I can remember being in Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, and it goes back that far where I, even in Cub Scouts, I was the leader of my pack. And then in Boy Scouts, I was the leader of the troop. Um, now, I only made it to Life Scout. I didn't make it to Eagle, but... But the reality is during that whole time, uh, all the different things that the Boy Scouts had, Order of the Arrow, um, the other programs you could be in, I had leadership skills that that kind of bubbled up, right? And so I would be the one that would um, go out on the trails and kind of take the kids along on the trails. Um, I'd be the one that would organize the meetings. Um, I would be the one that kind of got involved from the beginning. So that's, it started in Boy Scouts. Nice, nice. Who influenced you in terms of leadership? Who are some of your mentors? Well, you know, the, the biggest mentor would have been my father and my mother. I mean, I wrote about it in the book, but I'll come back to this again. You know, I had parents that were really, really hard workers. Um, I, I won't say that they worked the smartest, but they were, they were definitely hardworking. Mm-hmm. And 
the thing they were also willing to do, especially my father, was take risks. And I think that leaders have to be risk takers as well. Um, if you're not a good risk taker, uh, if you're not willing to do that, it's kind of hard to be a leader. I think the two go hand in hand because everything that you do associated with leadership, whether it's hiring somebody new or investing in a new project or your willingness to take on um, a new division of a company or to sell a part of your company, every time you look at those and do the analysis, granted you need to surround yourself with the right kind of people to help you do that, but you have to be willing to take a risk. I was the first ones that influenced me with relation to anything having to do with leadership. Um, and then I would say my college professors, because I actually watched a few of them that I was, um, I was a TA for one of them. And um, I, I saw people that were leaders and I admired them uh, tremendously. And then when I got into business, um, I, I immediately, my first major jobs right out of college was working for an insurance company. And the man that was there was um, a gentleman by the name of Grant Benning. And Grant, um, believe it or not, is the father of Annette Benning. And, you know, he told me that I had to go to Dale Carnegie right away and take all the courses. And you know who the teacher was? He was. Uh, so not only was he the leader of the business, he basically was the one teaching the sales courses. So I found it quite interesting that I early on in life got surrounded by these people that were always trying to improve my skills. And I think that's a key about a leader. If you surround yourself and you're, whether you're an avid reader, voracious reader, you want to learn. If you're not a continual learner, then to me, you're not a good leader. Uh, leading and learning go together and you've always got to be willing to take that risk. If somebody writes something in a book and you want to try and implement it, or if you hear something at a workshop or a seminar, and you think it might be something that you should implement, you need to be able to take action on that. So if you're a, if you're a leader, you're a learner. Nice. Nice. Great. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, and we look forward to also having your book out next year, Hacking the Gap, A Journey from Intuition to Innovation and Beyond. And uh, I've got a sneak peek at it, and it's got a lot of good stuff in it. So. Thank you. And I your podcast. Forward, I look forward to reading your new book as well, your leadership book. That that's what Thank this you. is all about. So That's it. Igniting the Leader Within. Thank you so much, and have a great day. 